Hi, and welcome to this week's series of Your Healthy Heart, and this is our eighth podcast titled Communication is the Scale that Measures Work-Life Balance. We will share our findings and solutions that for, for some seemingly elusive balance in our lives. We are Poppy and Jeff Spencer, relational experts, speakers, and authors, and today's podcast is exciting because in a bit we're going to bring on a special guest, another expert, our friend and colleague, Jody Amon, speaker, author of the book, You One, Anxiety Zero. Yes, and I'm Poppy, and Jody is an energetic and inspirational leader who says you can call her an anxiety tamer. I'm, I'm thinking of a lion, lion here. Lion tamer, sure. A forgiveness counselor. That's beautiful. Uh, forgiveness is at eight on our emotional clock a relationship coach, hey, like us, a guilt releaser, an unconditional lover, us too, mm -hmm. and a hope renewer. And we do the same thing. We're excited to spend more time with Jody in a few weeks when we meet again with our master coach, Jack Canfield, the author of the Chicken Soup for the Soul series. We are all headed to his home to have a two-day intensive retreat with Jack, there's just like 15 of us. So awesome. You know, and we all need coaching. And Jack is our mastermind coach. He is. You know, last week we, we shared with you the five things you can do to keep the feeling of Valentine's Day in your hearts all year long. So hope you guys took some good advantage of those tips. So even though Valentine's Day was last week, no worries. You can still inspire your partner with love and connection every day. Just go to our website at relationalexperts.com and check out our Valentine's Day article or listen to last week's podcast, which is under the media tab at relationalexperts.com. And in this month's series of Your Healthy Heart, we focus on good interchange for a healthy heart. Back in our January's podcast, we introduced you to our trademark communication tool, the Emotional Clock. And this is the bedrock of our work as relational experts. We developed the Emotional Clock as a tool to help people with their communication. One thing that we lacked years ago that let us get split up, unfortunately, but we found each other. The 12 emotions on the clock assist you to immediately identify and address, address folks being the operative word, issues, concerns, challenges, nagging feelings, doubts. You got it. You name it. And tell them what yesterday was. Yesterday was our sixth wedding anniversary. We're so proud to share that. We've been back together and happily married and just excited for about 60 more, but I don't know if we're going to live that long, but <laughs> Maybe, what the heck. You never know. We could go to Mars. They, they were talking about going to Mars again. How would that let us have longer life? <laughs> I don't know. Okay. Maybe there is. All right. So this is our eighth podcast, and today's topic is work-life balance. And we said it that way for, those, for that particular reason, that the three words might actually send shutters down your back. Work-life balance. You know, I always wondered how to write the three words when I was teaching as a psychology professor at Ringling College of Art and Design. I was like, are they hyphenated? Is there a forward slash? Is there a period between the two words, the three words? The three words don't go together like mixed veggies. You mean like Forrest Gump used to say, we go together like peas and carrots? You know, just the thought of these three words evokes immediate tension and anxiety in folks because you kind of start asking yourself, well, how, how is your work-life balance? How, how am I doing on that? You know, just saying it in itself creates anxiety and tension in people. And if you're over-focusing on one or the other, you're going to compromise either way you go, you know, no matter what you do. So it's a, it's a very big challenge. We believe that work-life balance is simply what you believe it is. Meaning there's no right formula. You know, there, you're, there's everybody's going to have a different idea of what this is and what the right balance is. The very important thing about this it is that you and your partner agree as to what it is. Communication becomes that scale of work-life balance and the title of our podcast today. Right. And you know what? It's not just you and your partner. It could be you and your family members, too. I know that when I sure. went back and got my master's degree, I had a family meeting. We sat down. We said, like, is this OK? This is going to take a chunk out of my weekends. I did weekend um, to get my master's degree. Yeah, I've but had the same thing. I remember mm -hmm. when my son was was young, 
changing jobs was requiring a whole lot more travel. I had to, you know, kind of let him know that I wasn't going to be able to go to all those soccer matches and basketball games and that I wouldn't be around as much and had to ask his patience with it. So the important thing is, is that you communicate. Mm -hmm. You have to sit down and, and hash it out. You know, one of the clients that we work with, she's a single mom of two. And after a few sessions with us, she recognized the culprit behind the stress of her work life. She said, I wasn't saying no enough. And that's like a really hard thing, especially for women. She said, I wasn't saying no to my kids when they wanted to have an impromptu sleepover, which would require me to make more schedules to drop off and pick up more of my time to deal with and expend more energy to the inevitable. And we all know this one, right? If you're a parent, fallout from crabby and sleep deprived kids the next day. You know, they stay up all night. Sure. And then she said to her clients, uh, she said when they asked to reschedule a time or make special accommodations, sometimes at the last minute, she said, sometimes if I'm if I'm feeling balanced, if I'm feeling OK, I'll say yes. But when work life is not balanced, I have to call a timeout for me. And I really like that. Mm-hmm. When she said that to us. She said, That's I nice. like that timeout. And she said um, so she said to her clients, I'm sorry, I can't make our appointment today, but we'll have to make it another day. Um, I have family commitments. Thank you for your understanding. And we like that gratitude part. Thank right. you for your understanding is a is a nice way of saying I can't. Um, and the same goes for her kids. She said, guys, I know a sleepover would be fun, but I'm occupied with my clients. It cannot make any last minute changes. And she said, even if the kids whine and plead, she explains to them that I'll do the same thing for you when clients ask me for a last minute schedule change. And we thought that was really... Um, a neat thing so that Make kids think, understand yeah. mm-hmm. and kids appreciate and value what that. you do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now we set goals every day, uh, including on the weekends. That way when we, we see them written down, we know what we're going to get into. And our goals and schedules always include downtime. And during that downtime, it's challenging to disconnect from technology. You know, these wonderful devices we have, these smartphones are with us almost all the time. In fact, you know, sometimes I make Fun of my uh, uh, one of our our children, we were watching. They they they, they have become one armed bandits because the the other hand always has the phone, so they only have one hand available to do anything. But the, it's hard to to turn off the office for a lot of us because you know you still can get those work emails, you can still get occasional messages and calls and texts that can come in. So it becomes really really hard to make that dif- differential that line in the sand of where then one one ends and it can your work life can keep bleeding into your personal life. And adding even more challenge to this is there's some businesses that that don't have the same work life values as you do. They demand more and they expect more. And you might feel a threat of your job disappearing if you don't put in that unpaid overtime. I know this is a this is a big thing. We've counseled several clients on this and like they are really frazzled like what should we do um i'm afraid someone else will sneak in and take my job if i don't stay for 12 hours a day and do my job and Mm -hmm. it's a it's a real challenge and so it's all about boundaries and it's about communication and we help people with how to communicate to that supervisor or manager or boss exactly how to um approach that subject and you know and even how to choose a job today there's so many wonderful opportunities to get information and intel on companies. There are customer reviews and employers. So when you're looking to to apply to a company, we always tell them, not only do your homework on it, but find out this one question from someone who works there. You know, even if it's a front desk person, the, the, the gatekeeper that you first meet, say, if you had to pick one thing that you love about working here, what would it be? And if the answer is... I feel valued as an employee or a team member, you'll want to work there. And a lot of these places also have these reviews where it's, it's they actually do voting on these things where it's one of the voted one of the top places to work because the employees say that. Right. So that's what you want to look for when you're looking for a job. And we can help you through that mm-hmm. too. So many of us unconsciously, and I read, read here, like not mindful or conscious, take for granted and we default into letting work become the priority. And this is this is common for any of us. We all have this happen. There's nothing more important than marriage or the relationship of the family, right? You know, this morning, uh, Jeff subscribes to one of the um, 
emails from the power of positivity. And we saw these words, be patient with each other. Your spouse is more important than your schedule. We thought that was like, you know, it's, mm-hmm. it's one of those little reminders, those those things to make sure that you keep that communication skill in balance. You know, at the same time, it's also to, important to in a relationship that the partner's respect each other's work schedules. Right. There's some things that can wait a few minutes. You don't necessarily have to talk about these things when you're late for a meeting. You can talk about them later. So respect that and don't make things worse. You know, and even when you do have time away from the office, uh, you may not look at your phone to check work emails, but perhaps you glance at, oh gosh, you know, Facebook, social media, Twitter feeds or news updates or games or any any number of entertaining apps we can all have. Poppy and I We'll often be doing Facebook. We do it together and we might be doing our own, but we'll often share comments back and forth. So it's not isolating us from each other. You know, we we, we talk about it. We share things. Oh, did you see what so-and-so said? In fact, we'd mentioned earlier that we had our, our sixth anniversary. It was just wonderful to read all the dozens of comments that are so many friends uh, shared with us about how, how delighted they are that we're enjoying this sixth year of this wonderful relationship. You know, the, we often will say things like, uh, if we aren't together, we can say, hey, I saw this on Twitter. And it's usually something that relates to things that we're already thinking about in our work, to a program where we offer or a client that we've worked with. And we assess where that person might be in their relationship dynamic and where we would have them on our emotional clock. And, and we've seen this happen for with a few of our clients where one partner claimed she felt isolated because her mate disappeared into his, his smartphone. You know, the communication took a huge hit. She didn't know what he was doing over there. It got very frustrating. We could see the anxiety just growing in her. You know, so our suggestion is to establish a, a smartphone time and, and an end time you know, with electronic devices and social medias. And you have to reach an agreement with your partner. Again, you're probably seeing an ongoing trend here. It's reaching an agreement with your partner, talking right. with your partner about it. There is a definite theme here, folks. Right. It's the communication is right. the key here for that balance. You know, one of our um, favorite shows. Oh, this is us. Yes, yeah, you, yes. Why don't you share about sure. that? Sure. We, we had a, just a, a very poignant illustration of this work-life balance. And this the show has is a very complex family drama. If you haven't seen it, we highly uh, suggest it. It's a wonderful show. One of the characters literally leaves a very, cr- just a critical moment in their in their job uh, because of the love for family. Another family member was in a big crisis, was having a big meltdown. And this this brother recognized it, and he only he knew that that this he was the only person at this moment that knew that this was going on, and only he could could do to do something to help this person in this critical state. And he made a decision at this moment in time that that his family member needed himself, and that 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 scale just got tipped all the way to hey, family is absolutely first. His career might have been finished be, finished because of this move, but it, it didn't matter. He made a decision to be with family member that was way more important. And and the other character in in This Is Us, which is a great, a wonderful program, he's an overachiever, a perfectionist, and I'm sure that Jody will will share with us a little bit later about that. And it it illustrated a very raw look at how someone sort of crumbles under the stress and pressure of trying to balance his home and his workplace. And the title of this podcast is Communication is the Scale that Measures Work Life Balance. And uh, we're going to get Jody here to talk about um, her insights and how we can keep that scale from tipping. So we're going to bring our friend Jody uh, into the equation now and get her on the line. So Poppy is going to do this. So again, Jody is <clears throat> a wonderful resource. We've uh, we've had the opportunity to spend some time talking with Jody and understanding more about her. Her business, and and one of the things I guess Poppy and I were most excited about in talking to her is that she shared so many of the same values. In fact, so many of the items that were in our emotional clock were in her her teachings and her work. So let's uh, bring her on the. Oh, oh. sorry. All right. Oh, uh, she just sent us. Um... Hold on, she's, folks. We're getting some updates here as we speak. <laughs> right. She's just like, but um, anyway, start to tell a little bit of the story about President's Day. Yeah. One of the we'll... things that uh, that Jody had in her 
in her book that we're going to ask her to highlight more about. You know, one of these critical moments that, that all people have, uh, especially when you're uh, as, a, as a child, when you learn some really hard things, you know, it's like first time you kind of get to understand, you know, there might not be a Santa Claus where she was having a conversation. And, you know, today being with her dad, with, with her dad being President's Day, speakerphone. All right. Hi, Jody. How are you? Good. How are you doing? We were just sharing with our listeners about your um, your poignant exercise in the book about President's Day and um, how you asked your father when you were a small child about um, uh, what, what are the presidents? Where are they now? Where are they now, Jody? I know they're dead. They're dead? They're dead. Isn't that scary? Doesn't it? Share the pants off you. Yes, it does. So we were we were saying, you know, so when you have those like earth shattering awarenesses and realizations, um, and you you made that choice as a young girl, you made that sort of it shaped your decision as a young girl that that you should be afraid, you know, how long do you think that shaped who you were? I think it shaped part of how, what I thought. For well, two decades really. Wow. Two decades, uh, I suffered with that idea, that fear of death, and that fear of suffering, really. And, and actually, it's just a fear of anxiety, isn't it? A fear of fear. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. That, yeah. That's that's wonderful. So, um, Jody Amon, again, here the book you just wrote. We were so excited. We already started reading it. Um, oh, it's called You Won Anxiety Zero. We just like that right off the bat. It's like you win. You know, it's like the anxiety doesn't get anything. No points at all, you know? <laughs> no points at all. No, it doesn't deserve any points. It just wants to mess up your life and take you down and, and keep you home and alone. And it's horrible. You know, one of the things, Jody, we wanted to, to when Poppy and I were talking about the, this, this topic for this week and we were putting together our notes for our, our podcast, we said just the, the, the comment, <clears throat> just asking the question, work-life balance, just saying those three words together can just tighten people's stomachs and just be the, a big anxiety producer. And I'm, I'm sure you've dealt with this a lot. Absolutely, it does. Absolutely, because it's so important to us. I think that's what, you know, fear really speaks to things that are important to us, things that are precious to us. And work is important to us. Our family is important to us. Pleasure is important to us. And so finding a balance that that works is so precious to us. And I think that's why it causes stress, is because we care so much. Right. Uh, that's such a good point. So it's it's our our desire for that balance that is it's sort of like counterintuitive that gives us the fear. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> gives exactly. us exactly. Yeah. Exactly. A lot of these things seem counterintuitive, but man, we we're so convinced they seem so logical that we should be stressed about that if we're not adequate. You know, it seems really logical for us to be stressed about that if it's not adequate. Whatever we're labeling as inadequate our balance is inadequate because right. we're just judging ourselves so badly um, right so we're causing more stress instead of the opposite which is what we want you know jody i think one of the things i would just this came to me here poppy and i haven't talked about this but this is one of the big i think big, big challenges that, that the women have nowadays too it i think that that question that balance has been a huge problem for a lot of ladies nowadays because, you know, like but my mom didn't work outside of the home. She was a, a homemaker. She she was there all the time and, and was there to help me. And she didn't have that conflict like so many women have nowadays that work and, and have that that always that challenge, that balancing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. So what do you what do you think about that? Do you ever have clients that you work with? Yeah, they, I mean, most of us are, right? And I'm there myself. I have kids and I work. And so right. I feel it. You know, you never feel like you're adequate in each, in either place, you know, because you can't give as much as you want to the kids. You can't give as much as you want to work because you're you're torn. Right. So it's always, you know, you're always feeling less than, you know, just not enough in either place. And so you can't be calm and feel balanced and feel good about either place when you're feeling like that. And I think that's how a lot of women feel. There's no place to really stand uh, and feel good because if you're working, 
it goes to show that you're not adequate as a mom. And if you're, you know, if you have a mom and a family, you can't throw 100% or 200% into your work. I right. think you can, but we think that we can't, you know? Right. But I like that term, so, not adequate. Why? Right. Or they, I, we always struggle with, you know, being worthy enough and, and that. So what, um, when people are, and and don't we also compare ourselves to others, whether it's, it's other it's other couples, it's other women, it's other parents, it's other men, it's other people in the workplace? I mean, how does that comparison filter into or factor into our lives as um, how we judge and measure ourselves in our work-life balance? I think that's everything. I think comparison is the driving factor and are thinking that we're inadequate. And it's, it's an operation of modern power, so it's, it's ingrained in our culture. Because we have so much freedom, and it's wonderful, I won't want to do live any other way, but because we have so much freedom, it's really up to us to kind of define our own uh, morality and what's right and what's good and what's the, the best place to be. And we have these cultural standards. Like you have to be young and pretty and perfect and the best mom and the smartest person and cool and you know there's all of these standards of our culture that we have to live up uh, live up to but the problem is they're not easily defined right we think they're much bigger than they are much higher than they are and we shoot we try to overshoot them because we're not sure where the standard is and we try to overshoot we try to be better than perfect uh, and we'll never get there so we'll always feel less than right we think that everyone's looking at us and comparing us we don't want to be left out we want to be included, and so this is really a, a highly motivation, uh, high motivation for us in our culture is to try to be better, and it could drive us crazy, and it does. Not in <laughs> the same way, but like crazy, like we just don't feel good about ourselves. Right, and then we become anxious, right? Absolutely, yeah. Well, you don't feel good about yourself, that means you don't trust yourself, because if you don't think that you're adequate in anything, you have no trust in yourself at all. And so if something bad happens, you're not going to be able to handle it. That's where anxiety gets you. Got it. Okay. Wow, great observation. So so what can we do? All right, we're coming to you, the expert. What can we do about this? Even the, the like, so, sort of anxiety light things that, that creep into our consciousness. Well, yeah, be, you know, the opposite of anxiety is trust. Trust, love it. It was so mind-blowing for me to discover this, but the opposite of anxiety is trust because anxiety is when you feel out of control and you feel like you can't, you know, you don't trust yourself to handle it because you're out of control. And if you began to trust yourself, then you wouldn't be susceptible to the anxiety anymore. And what the, the activity that I most tell people to do is every night, you've heard of a gratitude journal, right? Mm-hmm. Right. We do one. Yeah, we do <laughs> gratitude posts. Awesome. Awesome. And everyone's heard of that, and it's really great, but there's something passive about it. You could be thankful for a sunset, but you haven't done anything for that yet, you know, or you haven't done anything for that. But I have people every night write down three things that they accomplished that day. Right. Three things that they did, because we are constantly looking at what we haven't done, mm-hmm. what we are deficit in, what we're not good enough about. That's all we look at. We have this deficit mentality. And it makes us more anxious. And so if every night we wrote down three things that we did that day, and they could be tiny. They don't have to be big, like change the world things. It could be empty the dishwasher or made that phone call you've been trying to make. And if we write those things down, then we start to notice that we do have skills. And we all have skills. Everybody has skills. We don't need the new skills. We need to be in touch and connect with the skills that we already have. And have faith in ourselves. So once you start writing this down, you start to notice that you're doing something. You're not just a passive recipient of the world. You are doing something. And it's really powerful. You start to see that there's things that are important to you. You start to see you have skills. You begin to trust yourself. It's really less changing. Right. And then you, you become a little bit more confident, more self-assured, right? We we do that. Uh, in addition to that, we, we have a, a goal sheet every day on our calendar. And we have yeah. goals that are out there. And we, we had to work hard at first when we wrote down like too many things, like we'd have eight yeah. things to do that day and only maybe five got checked off. But we learned to celebrate 
the ones that we checked off. And so we we haven't written down the accomplishments, but we've checked off the goals. And that check mark, I know, hits the reward system in my brain at least. <laughs> exactly. Right. That's exactly you're right. That would that would work just as well too. Um celebrating. People don't celebrate what they do. Yeah. They constantly think back to what they haven't done, you know, it's it's very stressful. So how would we reframe those people that still might get stuck like like I used to and say, oh, but I had four things that I didn't accomplish today, even though I accomplished five things? Well, we, we teach people to celebrate the things they do accomplish. You know, just pause for a moment. Take that pregnant pause and be like, I just did that. We don't do this at all, but we could. I started to do it, and it's so powerful. to do energy. Right. So we feel so unmotivated. When you think you have all this stuff to do and you can't get to it, you see all your deficits, it zaps you of all your energy. So you feel unmotivated and you can't get anything done. Great. Okay, so but if you don't look at the deficits. Take that moment, yeah, if you take that moment to look at what you did, you'll be energized for that next thing. The total opposite. Okay. So let, let's get back to, like, work-life balance. So you... I mean, you shared with us, you have a lot going on. You have a full plate. How do you help people sort of divvy up their full plates into bite-sized pieces? Well, one of the things I talk about, I have this one, I, I'm a YouTuber, so I have a lot of videos, but I have this one video on decluttering your house to declutter your mind. Yes. And I, I talked about my practice of even using those few minutes. You know, sometimes you just have a few minutes before you have to leave to go somewhere. Yes. I use that time to do stuff. Most people don't use it because they think if they, they're going to clean the kitchen, they want to do it perfectly, so they wait till they have more time. Right. I'll, I'll do a little teeny bit of it. So Perfect. Partly done. Or, and, you know, so I have a couple minutes here and a couple minutes there. If I walk downstairs, I'm taking anything that has to go downstairs. If I walk upstairs, I take anything that has to go upstairs. If I'm walking on one side of the house, so... I'm kind of, I don't notice I'm getting all this stuff done because I'm just kind of, it's just in there. It's just in the regular thing that I'm doing when I do something else. And you know what? It's like our other mastermind coach, Steve Harrison, who's awesome in our Quantum Leap um, program where we met Jody. He says that too. He says, whenever you are in motion, you will automatically, you know, sort of un, uh, build the foundation for that confidence and that that continued forward momentum. Exactly. So when you're paused, it's so hard to get started. But after the first step, it's a lot easier. So all you have to do is do the first step. Right. And all you have to do is psych yourself out. Now, everyone thinks that some people are motivated and they're, you know, they're very busy and other people aren't. I think that I'm a very busy person, but my brain makes me want to stop all the time. I think all of our brain wants us to resist. It's an ego thing. Yes. We constantly want to resist change. And so all of us have that unmotivated voice going through, like, oh, just do it tomorrow, or just don't buy, it's too much, or uh, you don't feel like it. And we have to constantly untrick our brain. Some people think that they're the only ones who think that, and they stop and say, <laughs> but you don't understand, I can't. And right. I do understand, I have the same voice telling me to stop. Um, but I have to out-trick my brain constantly. So people get stuff done, out-trick their brain. People don't think that they're the only ones thinking that. Isn't that, isn't that interesting? You know, we all yeah. have that same voice in our heads. You know, Jody, one of the things that people often talk about, the challenges of sometimes working together as husband-wife teams, I think one of the great things that Poppy and I do is that we, we're very good about motivating each other. You know, like often and maybe in the evening, I'm after dinner and I'm, I want to settle down and just be quiet and Poppy will go, this, well, Jed, why don't we work on, on this? And I'll, my, my initial thought might be, uh, yeah, I wasn't really up for that, but then you, know, you once you start doing it, you're like, oh yeah, it's great, and I think I'll do that yeah. sometimes for her as well, where she might be discouraged by it, about something and uh, not thinking that she wants to do it, and I go, oh, come on, we can do that now, and she, all right, and next thing you know, yes. we're moving. So sometimes I, I'm Jeff is very good at this. He's very good at um, time um, assessment, and I'm I'm thinking like, oh, I have ten things, I can get them done in an hour. And it's like, I'm, I'm usually way off, you know, I'm not, I'm not. And so he's very good about, he said, well, I think, you know, we should allot a little bit more time for this and for that. 
And um, especially I, when you live in Sarasota, Florida, this time of year, and the driving can be a real problem with all the traffic. Yeah. So, so we can't schedule too many appointments outside of you know we we made like four client calls on Friday and we left the entire day open. Now the old me would have set that up for like an hour. And it, it was great because we had traffic and we we got to linger a little bit longer at these um clients, prospective clients that we were meeting with and it was really it was really it it turned out really well. So, um we we had something that we were going to ask you about. You know, we have our emotional clock, our trademark communication tool, and um, we have the fear setting at six o'clock. That's the fight or flight setting. And I know you've talked about that a lot. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the ways people can identify the fears on the off balance they feel when personal and professional worlds clash? You know, sometimes people don't realize it till it's kind of catastrophic. So what are some early signs that they could realize that something might be off? Well, a lot of times, like, uh, a lot of times we have physical symptoms that to listen, even like digestion issues or something, you know, because if we're stressed a little bit or our adrenaline's higher, our cortisol levels are higher, it, the it first place it shows up is in the stomach. Okay, good. It's a clue. It's not, it's not conclusive, but you're asking for, like, clues. If you feel uneasy, you know, about something in your life, it might show up in the stomach. Um, but also it just might be a general sense of unease. Right. If you notice that you're judging yourself harshly, like really be negative on yourself. Then nice. Definitely that is a big clue that there's something off uh, for your life, like in your, uh, you know, in what in your day really that you're the, the way you're structuring uh your day uh, or in relationships is a good time there's something off in your relationship so those stress hormones cause a lot of things and we know those symptoms you know our stomach hurts we feel a lot of energy under the skin we feel uneasy um all the way up to panic and anxiety but even when they're just starting to be released remember the amygdala you know, it was developed in evolution to protect us. And so anytime there's something strange, something a little off, I mean, imagine like 2 million years ago, if something was a little off, if something was a little strange, if you had this inkling, a little snapped branch, then it could signal danger. So all of these things trigger our amygdala to release our hormones. And so if you're confused, if things are strange, if you're worried, all that stuff will start that stress response. Right. So and then and then uh, as happens with many people, they start they they transfer those thoughts and feelings onto other people, and they go, "Oh, someone's looking at me with a stink eye, or they're not smiling at me." So my coworker, we get really sensitive, yeah, right? we get really sensitive, and so we we start looking at our coworker, thinking they're judging me, when in fact you're saying it's really our own self judgment. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It's People interesting. People can't judge you unless you're judging yourself. Right. Oh, I like that. Say that again. I love that. People can't judge you unless you're judging yourself. I Ooh, love it. Good stuff. I love yeah, it. And so you mostly, when, when you notice, mostly you're just judging yourself and you're thinking people are judging you, but sometimes people actually are judging you. Yeah. But it only hits you or you don't even know about or aware of it when you're judging yourself for that. I love it. And people only judge you when they're judging themselves, their own selves. If they're judging you, they're judging themselves 10 times more. So it's always related. It's always a reflection of the self. Yes. We've told that to so many. Yeah. Yeah. We've told that to so many of our, well, we have five kids between us and um, our our clients too and it's like usually that's a, a sign of someone else's insecurity or our anxious feelings or whatever it is that's just projected onto you you know yeah so oh i know when we were young our parents were saying oh they're just saying that because they're jealous yeah nice. that's actually true yeah yeah you isn't know, that funny it because they're judging themselves it's just a different way to say it yeah except when you're in that in that receiving end of it and someone says well Jealousy is the best form of flattery, and someone's like taking credit for work done at the office or something. It really doesn't sit well. <laughs> it just doesn't. No, it's no. not enough of a it's bomb. Validated, right? We don't want to give advice until we really validate somebody and they're asking for advice. Yeah, but, uh, it is good advice, but if you haven't been validated yet, you do not want to hear that. 
You yeah. want someone to validate you. I you like know, that. That's awful. Yeah. We need the validation yeah. first before the yeah. lesson. Yeah. 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 I love right. it. Exactly. And maybe they don't need the lesson. Sometimes if you validate someone, they already know the lesson and they'll come to it themselves. The validation is really important. But a lot of times we give advice because we want to help people. We want them to feel better. We want to save them. And we give advice, but it's too soon. They haven't been validated yet. I love this. And they feel more judged by the advice. So not only do they feel hurt, but they're taking it personally, and that's wrong. It's a, um, it's a, it's a balance. That's like um, Miguel Ruiz, who said the four agreements. You know, what the, one of the four agreements was don't take things personally. And you just yeah. have to, like, sit with it for a little bit to help to reframe it and have the feeling go away and the thoughts. Right, exactly, exactly. So what I say is first you validate, then you can take a step back. You know, if you don't validate yourself, it's hard to get to that not taking it personally. But it's so easy to validate yourself. It's really self-compassion. It's just like, I get why you feel that way. It's really so simple. But we don't know how to do it. We don't have any compassion for ourselves at all, you know? I love it. Hey, Jody, we are so stoked to see you in a couple of weeks in Santa Barbara, California, in Jack Canfield's living room. Are we so excited? Yeah, this is going to be awesome. And um, all right, so we're going to head off here. But yeah, tell us where uh, your book, uh, where can folks get that book? They can get it anywhere books are sold. Yeah, you won Anxiety Zero. Okay. Yep. And your website? My website is uh, Jody Eamon, J O D I A M A N dot com. So you can find all my videos there, all the uh, services that I have that help people with stress and anxiety and balance, all there for you. I love it. And for us, we're Poppy and Jeff Spencer, relationalexperts.com. Please leave comments or inquiries. And uh, we'll pass them along to Jody if uh, you want to ask more questions or you can just email her yourself on her website. Um, and we even offer a 30-minute consultation that's free if you, we'd love to hear from you. Yeah, next week we're going to close out our Healthy Heart uh, series. And the topic is communication and the psychology of social interaction Stop, drop, or roll. Oh, boy. With the political landscape influencing our lives, we will offer tips on how to maintain peace in our hearts. Wow, that's a tough topic. <laughs> this will be really fun. Anyway, and Jody, if you're around next week, we could even have you back on. I know you'd offer wonderful wisdom and guidance again. And we, oh, thank, you, awesome. we thank you for your um, sharing your incredible um, experience and knowledge and insights and that's it for relationalexperts.com and Jody Amon. Thanks Jody. Thanks Jody. Thank See ya. Thanks. Bye. Bye.